Well, as much as we miss college football right now, this has been an amazing time of year for sports. We have A&M coming off of a big baseball series win versus Mississippi State. We have spring football starting. Three coaches taking to the podium at the start of spring. Such a treat. We didn't get coordinators under Jimbo. We got coordinators under Elko. That was great, and I'm going to talk about that today along with other spring rumblings and news and things that I've noticed about the early reports from spring and especially these coaches taking to the podium. But, of course, the March Madness run by Texas A&M basketball, a group of Aggies that we're all extremely proud of. I want to start the show by talking about these guys. We'll get into some spring notes and observations later in the show. But first, let's talk about these basketball Aggies. How could you not be proud as hell of this team for fighting toe-to-toe in a heavyweight battle with the Houston Cougars, the top-seeded Cougars, one of the best teams in the country? A&M took them down to the bitter end, matching blow for blow, dropping down as much as 7 and 11 at separate times in this game, and coming back twice. And of course, just overcoming obstacles, overcoming adversity time and time again throughout the game. And that's just the Buzz Williams mantra there. That's just what Buzz Williams is. It's a tough, gritty basketball team. And it showed at the highest possible level in this March showdown. It was a great game. You could talk about a lot of different things. You could talk about how Boots was always there to respond whenever the team went down. It seemed like Boots was the initiator in those situations, making tough, contested baskets in the paint, getting to the line, which wasn't great for AM as a whole on the night. We'll talk about some negatives in a second. Obasaki, really the same thing, was in foul trouble, but was able to create and find tough buckets when AM desperately needed them. Offensive rebounding, the huge shot by Andy Garcia at the end of the game. Defensive specialist, rebounding specialist, Andy Garcia, dead eye three point shooter in the clutch. Add that to his title list. Great performance, man. Great performance. And, and Houston's a great basketball team, guys. Great defensively, good size, physical basketball team, great shooters. We saw all that. They gave it to us, but AM gave it right back to them. I want to talk about some downfalls of the team. What, what went wrong in the game? Obviously, it was free throws. That was the most controllable aspect of this game that just wasn't there for AM. Terrible from the line and got tons of opportunities. Probably could have gotten a couple more opportunities, which we'll talk about in just a minute, but terrible at the line. Couldn't defend the three ball. A lot of guys getting open on screens. Defenders not really scrambling on broken plays to find three-point shooters. It was an issue throughout the night. They got open three after open three. And Buzz in the presser after the game actually cited that as the main reason for the loss, just the inability to get stops. I look at the free throws. I look at the after timeouts and some of the flow on the offense, and I question what the goal of the offense is. You don't see a lot of off-ball movement. You don't see a lot of guys running off of off-ball screens in this offense. And I bitch and moan about that, and I did on X. But when you think about it, A&M is scoring close to 100 every game to close this year out. And typically, that's enough to win you a basketball game. And you scored close to 100 versus one of the best defenses in the country. It took overtime, but still, you're scoring. You're, you're finding ways to score. You're just kind of grinding out buckets with the free throws, the putbacks, the tough layups, not getting a lot of three-point shots. Obviously, Wade Taylor had an off game, and we got to talk about Wade. We all love Wade Taylor, legendary Aggie. Maybe he's the greatest Aggie basketball player of all time. It's him or AC Law. You can debate that. He's beloved. You're not here without Wade Taylor. And it's okay to acknowledge that he had a down game. And he was playing against one of the best defensive lineups and individual defensive players in the country in Jamal Shedd. Took him out of his game. Every shot that Wade took was either contested, off balance, or was a hard fight. He hit a couple of clutch buckets, but he didn't have a great game. Maybe if he hits a couple more shots, you win the game. But it's hard to point at that when you're missing so many free throws on the game. You look at the free throws first, and you can mention Wade as a storyline of the game. But you were right there in it. You hit your free throws, you win it. I need to bitch further. And I only do this because... We're all inspired by this performance. We love this team. As much as we're thrilled for this team, we're heartbroken for them at the same time for being that close, a golden opportunity in the Sweet 16. The belief if you knock off a top seed in Houston, a team that already beat you earlier in the year, a team that 
many people have in their Final Fours. If you knock them off, you go to the Sweet 16 against Duke, you're feeling really good. I feel for them for missing that opportunity, obviously, so I want to bitch about this. Oh my gosh, the refs were pretty bad. There were a lot of foul calls in this game against Houston, but there should have been even more. A&M was getting constantly mauled in the paint, mauled at every junction in the game. Every, everybody was, they're, they're a physical team and they play physically, and you could have called a lot more. There was also a moment in the game where Jace Carter got a steal, had a fast break two-on-one opportunity, and the refs blew it dead at around half court saying he stepped out. They showed the replay. He clearly didn't step out. Houston ends up scoring on the next possession. So you look at that as a four-point swing. You forced overtime, so the four-point swing goes the other way. You win the game. I know. You missed free throws. You didn't stop the three-point shot. You can't really point at those uncontrollable factors like the refs when the controllables were not in your favor. But man, I just do it because I love these guys. I'm inspired by these guys. Really, really cool story to the year with the peaks and the deep valleys and trenches of the year. That losing streak after beating Tennessee at home, that huge win. Then to lose a bunch of games and to finish the year strong yet again. Buzz Williams' team, they obviously peak at the end of the year. And this time they had an opportunity to advance the Sweet 16 and couldn't do it. Real quick on Buzz. I still see people saying fire Buzz. And after this, I'm really, really farther from that than I've ever been. Or at least... I have been in the last couple of years. It's been a storyline, especially when you're losing five games in a row or whatever the losing streak was. You wonder, like, what's going on here? Why are these teams coming up short? We had a lot of guys coming back this year. But to see the team fight, to see what they did when it really matters in March in the SEC tournament, late in the season, you really feel good about giving Buzz a couple more chances, especially next year. You have everybody coming back except for Boots and the starting center. You have an opportunity to go get a lot of guys to capitalize on this big game. I mean, this is a big game that everybody was watching on a Sunday night. A&M basketball is top of mind right now. Most people call that the best game of the tournament thus far. So maybe you can get a little bit more buzz in the program. I did not plan that pun. But maybe you have a little bit of buzz in the program right now, and you're able to get a couple of more high-profile portal guys to fill in as a big man and maybe as a boots replacement. But everybody else is coming back. You get Anderson Garcia, you get Wade Taylor, you get Obasiki. You got a lot coming back, guys. You could put a really good basketball team together next year, and I don't see why you would cut ties with Buzz right now. So I'm riding with Buzz to next year. Hopefully he can get some more guys. Hopefully the offense can take another step forward. And we go from there. Just a really, really fun basketball game, a game that had my heart pounding like I was watching an A&M football game. I don't know about you guys, but my heart was just beating out of my chest in that one. What a great game. What a fun end to the season. Congrats to the Aggies. We love you. That was really fun. Moving on to football. And before we get into it, guys, can you do me a favor and subscribe to this channel? And if you think you're subscribed, just double check and make sure you are. We're trying to grow this thing. Bring more Aggies into the discussion. Bring more college football fans into the discussion. Obviously, I'm trying to bring you more Aggie sports than just football now. I'm trying to broaden my horizons. I've never been a huge Aggie basketball or Aggie baseball guy until these last couple of years. So I'm trying to increase my knowledge base there and bring you more of that kind of stuff, that kind of conversation to these shows. But of course, our base is always Aggie football. And if you want to be part of this offseason part of spring, part of this next season, which I think we have a lot of fun talking about this team in the year one under Mike Elko, please consider subscribing. It helps me greatly. It helps me grow this thing. You guys have been awesome. Thank you. Spring ball. It kicked off last week, the same day that A&M was in the tournament, same day A&M was having a series versus Mississippi State. Really a huge storm of just Aggie athletics. It was great. Just a ton of stuff to consume. The X refreshing was just off the charts on those couple of days. But within the madness, we had three, yes, three podium visits from three different coaches. Mike Elko allowed defensive coordinator Jay Bateman and offensive coordinator Colin Klein to take to the podium and answer questions from the press. That is not something we got from Jimbo but once a year in fall. We got it in spring. You can look at it as an introductory presser, maybe. You can look at it as a spring presser. I hope that's a sign of things to come. These guys are much more open to talk about tangible things about the football team. Start with Coach Elko, took the podium first, fielded the most questions. It really seems like these coaches are in wait-and-see mode with this team. Going into spring, 
I thought that the number one goal of spring was going to be instilling playbook, instilling philosophies. And while that is obviously going to be a major factor in this spring, it is now clear to me that there are two factors above that or two goals above that that are higher priority on the priority list than just learning the playbook. And the first one, it's pretty simple, actually. These guys are learning how to practice for a, under a Mike Elko team, under a Mike Elko coach team. He's talked about it in a couple of interviews now how these guys need to learn how to flow from practice group to practice group, from period to period, from session to session, and work efficiently. They got to practice practicing, man. They got to learn how to practice right so that they can effectively sharpen their tools for the game throughout their careers. They're setting the tone in that regard first. Colin Klein mentioned several times how they're building from the fundamentals up. And I don't know if fundamentals is a buzzword that we heard a lot under Jimbo's staff, under Jimbo's re regime. And maybe this is something that comes innately with a new coaching staff. But I really like to hear them starting from ground up. Both Elko and Colin Klein were asked about scheme. Elko's been asked a couple of times. He was actually on Paul Feinbaum recently. He was asked there as well. What's the scheme here? What's the offense going to look like? And of course, that's everybody's question coming off of the Jimbo Fisher era where the offense seemingly was stuck in mud after Jimbo was such an offensive guru. Really weird to see. And people want to know what the follow-up to that's going to be. And both have really said that they're taking a wait-and-see approach to what this offense will be. But they've said that they'll be multiple. They said that they're going to be explosive. They're going to go at you. But they've both indicated that they're going to tailor make this thing around the players. And that's something we heard from Bobby Petrino when he first came in. Feed the studs, something we were all very excited about. And while we did see some offensive adjustment under Bobby, we didn't see the full thing shift away from Jimbo's clutches, if you will. But now, it sounds like they're going to build this specifically for the Aggies. And of course, there are general philosophies in line with, uh, with Colin Klein. Like, I know we're going to see an H-back. I know we're going to see a lot more activity in the offensive line. But this spring, they're going to really build this thing out. They're going to build it to the players. And the players that they haven't seen in person, in pads, or even in shell or football helmets yet, they're learning everything on the fly, and they're going to build it for these players. So Elko actually specifically said that defining this as a scheme or putting it in a, in a basket of, of philosophies or a basket of ideologies in terms of play calling is not appropriate, and that's that's maybe the easy thing that analysts will say is happening. Oh, it's a spread offense. It's a pro-style offense. He's trying to smash that narrative and tell you that this is going to be the A&M offense, the offense that features your Noah Thomases, your Moose Muhammad's, your Connor Wigmans. It's an offense for our guys, and that will evolve from roster to roster over the years. So that's great to see. I can't wait to see what we what what we get in the spring game as far as the play calling and the types of plays we're going to see, the formations we're going to get, the players we're going to see. Talking about the players. Like I said, wait and see mode all over the place. Competition all over the place. Elko said that competition breeds the best results. I think most coaches would agree with that. Most coaches would say that. And that's not really unique to the situation here at A&M. But what is unique to this season at A&M compared to years past is that A&M has a declared starting quarterback going into spring, and I don't think we've had that since Kellen Mond's senior year. And that was the best quarterback play we've had at A&M in a long time. Say what you will about Kellen Mond, it was better than the following three, four years. And you can count the few games of Connor that we got, but that wasn't a full season. That's not a fair comparison. Regardless, Connor Wigman is your starting quarterback in spring. He is practicing as a pocket quarterback only, not a full go yet. And if you look at some of the spring images that we got, that foot, that injured foot is heavily, heavily taped, and Connor is sticking in the pocket. Not going to be running around in spring. They're going to play it safe. Why would you risk it? Why would you run the quarterback? It makes no sense. He's coming off an injury, so it makes total sense. But it's great to see that Connor is indeed the quarterback in spring. He's the guy getting the first team reps. He's the guy that's going to be out there running the, running the offense. Maybe not doing everything he's capable of. Maybe not going off script as much. But hey, he's out there. He's learning. He's growing that chemistry back that we saw him starting to cultivate between Jade Walker and Noah Thomas early last season. And we really saw some flashes from those guys early in the year. So it's great to have Connor as your declared starter. And of course, Elko was, was not hesitant to compliment the two guys behind him in Marcel Reed and Jalen Henderson both of which he said are in a healthy competition. He says no one is safe, not even Connor is safe, but Connor is the starter right now, and that's great. 
he gave some injury updates, and I'm sure you know about most of these. It was Aki, it was Dewberry, it was Shamar Turner, it was Eni White. These guys were hurt in the bowl game for the most part, and they're still out. They're either going to be totally limited. They're either going to be very limited or totally out of spring. And he was asked about Bryce Foster, and of course, we have to touch on this in this channel. Give a really brief answer. He said, he's track. And that was it. There's a lot of brevity to the answer there, a lot of sharpness to the answer. And of course, we're going to read too much into things, because that's what we do. That's what we do in the middle of the offseason. I sense a little frustration there. Of course, you want your players to play. I've said on this channel many times, if Bryce Foster wants to support this university, wants to push forward his athletic career by participating in track, that's his, prer that's his prerogative, that's his freedom, that's his right. Good for him. That's what he wants to do. But we have to be real about this. This may jeopardize his chances of being a starting center going into next year because it's not like he's coming off of a stellar year last year. It's not like he's coming off of even an ACL injured year where the previous year was very promising in 2021 and you want to give him a go. No, we saw a full year of Bryce Foster and it wasn't what we had hoped. And now he's not here in spring and you have all these offensive linemen, these experienced guys, it's a very experienced veteran group, and these guys are all going to go out there and compete in this first impression era that is spring football in 2024. Bryce isn't going to be there. Colin Klein in his presser also mentioned when asked about the offensive line that they're going to be moving guys around. Multiple guys are going to be playing a bunch of different positions. He also specifically said that multiple guys will be snapping the football. So you might be looking at some new centers out there. You might be looking at new guys who are able to play center in this new system. So what I'm suggesting is that by the time fall comes around, we might be looking at a totally new offensive line group. We might be looking at a totally revamped five, and it might be the same guys. They might be shuffled around. We don't know. And you might be looking at a different center come fall, especially with Bryce not being here. But that doesn't mean Bryce isn't going to play. Bryce could maybe come out and play guard or tackle next, next fall. He's 6'5". He can play either position. Pretty versatile body right there. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see Bryce come out and be a guard where center is a much more, I mean, not much more, but center is more cerebral of a position than any of the other offensive line positions. They're all cerebral. They all entail reading the front in front of them, communicating with your neighbor, communicating with the offensive line, but the center has an even heightened level of that duty. So maybe Bryce comes out in a more simplified position at guard next year. We don't know, but what we do know is they're trying new things. And you have, a, like I said, a lot of experienced guys in this offensive line group, whether they're experienced on the field in SEC play or have been around the college locker room for years, the college weight room for years, have been waiting behind the scenes. I mean, you got three nice offensive line additions in the portal this winter in Hinton out of Florida Atlantic, Reed Adams out of Kansas, and Graham out of Troy. So you have even more, and those guys are all upperclassmen. So you have even more guys to plug and play with on this offensive line group. So I would suggest that it's a it's a it's an open season. It's open season for the offensive line. It, it's it's open competition for the offensive line, just like it is for corners and DBs, because both of those position groups were lackluster last year. They were both the glaring they were the glaring holes of the offense and the defense last year. So look at that. Look at those two position groups with a very open mind, Aggies. Because anything can happen there. Speaking of that DB group, defensive coordinator Jay Bateman also took to the podium. Great to hear from him. He confirmed what I and many of you guys have been saying about this hire. And I know a lot of people have questioned this hire, maybe the least flashy name, if you will, that was added in this coaching search was Jay Bateman. But he confirmed that he and Mike Elko are a hand-in-glove fit in terms of philosophies and the total outlook on football as a sport. Both you would call football guys. And what a football guy is to me is just like kind of a down-to-earth, upfront, blunt, tactical no fluff kind of a coach. I, I wouldn't consider Jimbo a football guy in that regard. And I don't mean to just rail on Jimbo. Obviously, Jimbo won a championship. You can't rail on him too much, but you can about his, eh, whatever. Regardless, Jay Bateman was no nonsense. He was short on the podium. It only took like seven minutes of our time on the podium. Gave some cool answers. He was asked about Jaden Hill, the transfer out of Florida, defensive back. And he said that he thought that Jaden Hill had a chance to go pro last year was thrilled when he entered the portal, was glad AM had a chance and ultimately landed him and thinks that he can definitely help this defensive back group out. 
a group that he mentioned, he has no idea who will be starting in. Who has no idea who the players in the group will be. Now, we can estimate that a couple of guys returning, like a Bryce Anderson, will have a really good shot at starting next year because we know what they are. We've seen them. But you have a lot of what we think could be high-level guys entering the room. And Jay Bateman confirmed what we were thinking, that this is open competition in this room. It's fair game. Anybody who's in that room can go out there and separate themselves as a starter right now. And I think that is such, that is, that is so what that room needed. That room needed to be rebuilt, revamped. It needed a fresh outlook. And maybe the starting group next year is all guys that were on the team last year. Maybe it is. But I think the competition, the new outlook will only make those guys better. But I have a feeling we're going to see some new faces out there. And it really does sound like Jaden Hill has a chance to win a starting spot or at least a rotational spot. So really cool to hear from these guys. It's something we didn't get last year. And I hope we get to hear from these coaches on a weekly basis going forward. So my biggest take, obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning of this rant about spring, was that they're really just rebuilding things from the ground up, focusing on fundamentals, relearning how to practice, teaching practice habits, learning what they have in their group of players. And then I think behind all of that is learn the playbook, which is just kind of going to happen naturally by being a part of this thing. We also got a few images from spring, a few, few videos, a few pictures, a few snapshots, not much to get from that. But if I'm going to put my fan hat on and tell you what I see, <laughs> I think Jade Walker looks absolutely massive right now. I was looking at him. I was like, is that Noah Thomas? Noah Thomas looking huge. And Noah Thomas is a pretty big receiver. No, that was Jade Walker looking thick, looking jacked, looking like a wide receiver one going into next year. And of course, they don't have pads on or anything yet. I mentioned that Connor Wigman is out there, quarterback one, but he is in the in the foot wrap or whatever it is. It's, it's probably just a bunch of tape protecting the hell out of that thing. Keep that man healthy at all costs. I thought Isaiah Williams looked really impressive just out there as a, as a large target, wearing the number zero now that, uh, that Anaya Smith once wore. But guys, it's not really my place to observe these practice images. I'm not one of the media guys that's out there at practice. I encourage you guys to go and look at those videos and those snapshots and those snippets from practice yourself. Go to TechSags, go to 247, look at that stuff. Here, we'll talk about things that are made available and we'll extrapolate, we'll, we'll analyze, and we'll try to digest it and make sense of everything we're seeing. So guys, that is all I have for you today. I'm going to be bringing you a couple more videos this week. And of course, the live show will be on Thursday, 8 p.m. Central. I hope to see you guys there. We have a lot of fun. We're going to open it up to callers once again this week. Hopefully some of you guys can tune in and call in. Turn notifications on. It'll help you see whenever I drop a video. But more importantly, you'll see when that live stream is about to go live so you can be a part of the show. We have a lot of fun, guys. So if you haven't done it, like and subscribe. It helps me greatly. Thanks for watching. I'll see you really soon. Gig'em.